With the establishment of Advance Base Camp as a functioning unit, the next step was to move onto the mountain proper to set up Camp 1. But that would have to wait. The weather closed in. There was a great feeling among the team. Living in each other's pockets in cramped and uncomfortable conditions, facing constant danger, could have had everyone on edge. But the mood was up. Andy's addiction to that most Australian of spreads, Vegemite, had puzzled the team's other Nepalese member, Tensing Sherpa, who remarked on Andy's consumption. <laughs> That's a winner of an ad. <laughs> it's possible to use the yaks to transport equipment part of the way to Camp One until they strike the glacier, which even the seemingly unstoppable yak can't handle. Remember, we said yaks had a mind of their own? Watch. That box contained some of the camera gear, which, luckily for the sake of this program, wasn't damaged. The yaks turn back. It's up to the climbers to carry the gear up the mountain. And it's becoming increasingly apparent the snow cover is much heavier than anyone expected, which means the avalanche danger is continual. So, with heavy snow still cladding the north face of Everest, the decision is made to set up Camp 1 about two kilometres away, an area the young Australian team believed to be relatively safe from avalanche danger. It's bitterly cold, with a strong wind sweeping down the valley. But once Naran has set up his kitchen and his specialty, a spicy vegetable and noodle stew, was sending out tantalising aromas, well... It was almost like home. Camp One established, and it was time to finalize the route they'd use for their attempt on Everest. Two things became apparent on their climb to the base of the North Face. The first was that the glacier which guarded the approach was secure. No hidden crevasse into which a climber breaking through the snowy lid could fall into white oblivion or none which they found. Secondly, that here at 6,000 meters, the heat became intense, with the sun reflected from mile-high ice walls, and only a minimum of radiation absorbed by the thin atmosphere. The climbing became agonizing. But I mean, we could always climb one of these other ways and fix a rope down there. Yeah. Okay, well... Finding the right route became all important. Almost like an exam, the mountain was setting the young Australians. No grades here, though. This was success or failure, life or death. Yeah, you want to go right. But if you had the rope coming down through there, just straight down through this time. Yeah, that'd be okay. And then you'd have a bit of diagonal part at the top, and it doesn't look too steep once you get no. past that next little rock. No, I reckon once you make steps, it'll be good. Well, that's still oh, yeah, I agree with that, but I don't, oh, except for the fact that you've got to zoom out this from the steep rock. You reckon it's really steep? Yeah. Yep, yeah. that's a good idea. Oh, good. What was on your map, Jeff? It had been a long time since any of the team had climbed seriously, especially on snow and ice. And getting geared up was not without its problems. We should be able to get up a couple of about 500 feet and fix that, I think. And uh, that'll make a good start, make it a really good start for you know, our next day. 
Well, it could be icy over the rocks. Yeah, right to the left of the uh, rock. Just over the left of the end of the rock. Yeah. It's only another uh, 20 yards. Actually, this whole thing seems to wobble a bit. Oh, well, this is it. We're Their equipment is minimal. Ropes, ice axes, and the vital crampons. Lightweight alloy frames with tall spikes would strap onto the climbing boots, allowing a stable foothold on ice. Good luck, good climbing. Thank 3,000 meters of almost vertical ascent awaited them, and a lucky break. A choke of snow formed an icy bridge onto the face, which made a comparatively easy start to the climb. Precision. Precision and concentration. But muscles unused for months came into play, and with each upward step, a growing confidence in their own and each other's ability. And with that confidence, fear of the icy vertical lessened, to be replaced with the sheer joy of climber's nirvana. Whew. What a day. Just so bloody big, that thing. Felt big, did it? Well, it didn't feel so big when we were on it. When you get back down to the glacier and look up. <laughs> I'd say in all we got up about a uh, thousand feet from the Berg's run. Get up really, really fast. <coughs> it's a good angle. Oh, this was good about the face, I reckon. Get you up quickly. I must confess, I'm not really convinced that it's uh, the best route yet. Which route do you reckon? <clears throat> I think the, the most surefire one of success would be the Japanese route. <coughs> but to do, a new, to do a new route, I guess it, uh, that's the line that we're on now, would be good. There's one of those big scoops that we've got across. Uh, because, well, I mean, <laughs> there's no choice. I mean, you've just, just got to cross it. And the best thing to do is probably cross it uh, more or less horizontally so you can get across it pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, as the afternoon sun was getting round into the hollow of that, quite a lot of ice was starting to come down, you know, quite big bits. I mean, only you know, that sort of size, but enough to make a nice sound on your helmet and bruise your arm. <coughs> so, uh, it was a good place to finish, really. Good days, good first day on the hill, for sure. To save carting the climbing gear backwards and forwards from camp under the ice face, it was stashed in a crevasse in an area thought to be safe from avalanche danger. As the weather began to close in, Greg, Jeff and Andy made it back down from higher on the face where they'd found a possible site for camp too and had buried vital equipment in another spot also considered free from avalanche danger. There's a tenuous but reasonable campsite there and uh, there may even be one another, about another 400 feet above but uh, that remains to be seen. Now it's just a, probably another two long rope lengths to a point where we can get above the cliffs and then after that going into the cool wire looks quite easy quite easy uh, even walking really <coughs> but hell it's spectacular Phew. and this was the scene next morning a heavy snowfall overnight ruled out any climbing for days the avalanche danger had been bad enough before now it would be suicidal Time for a spot of socializing. The mountain's bad news, and the climber's grapevine has reported the arrival of a large American expedition over the spur from the Australian base camp. Well, welcome to the Everest Tilton. It would have been a lot shorter. It would have been about a third of the distance to walk yeah. or, or carry to three as opposed to what we did. Yeah, we had a big debate about... These Americans are old Everest hands. They have seen the mountain in all her moods. And the team veteran, David Maher, has probably as good a working knowledge of her foibles as any man alive. So, we're, we're pretty happy with this way. It's, um, it's, it's steep up to here. It's beautifully direct, this climb. It's just an all-time classic. It's, uh, it's really clean and it's straight ahead. And it's comparable. I think it's, it's uh, 
finer route than what the Japanese did in 80 in uh, variation of the Hornbine Couloir. And uh, it's, uh, I just wish we were really back there ourselves in the same place, not where we're at, <laughs> personally. <sighs> I'd feel a lot better about it. <laughs> which means, in climbing terms, that the young Australians have chosen a really tough route.